Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, thank you for joining us for Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. Today we speak with an NMSU professor who is also a Vietnam veteran. Dr. David Boji has been using storytelling and equine therapy to help veterans open up and share their experiences along with their struggles during deployment so that they can move forward with their lives after returning home. Here's a look at what he does. NMSU business professor and veteran Dr. David Boji says when he was preparing to return from his deployment to Vietnam, he was told not to wear his uniform and to try to blend into society the best way he could. He says it was hard to all of a sudden stop being a soldier and return to the man he was before he left. Because after Vietnam, we had nothing. Uh, country didn't really want us uh, back. The psychological association had written out you know, things like shell shock and stress. And it took us till the 1980s to actually get uh, post-traumatic stress disorder into the psychological um, assessment manuals. Boji says on average, 22 veterans per day in the United States commit suicide. And they're trying to tough it out themselves. And instead of getting that sense of the future and stop reliving the past, um, they're caught in a cycle, they're caught in a vicious circle. According to a 2014 Veterans Health Administration report, the suicide rate among young male and female veterans is on the rise. The report states male veteran Health Administration users ages 18 through 29 had a suicide rate of nearly 58 out of 100,000 in 2011, compared to just over 40 in 2009. Female veterans had a rate of just over 14 per 100,000 in 2011, compared to nearly 13 in 2009. Today, Boji works with military veterans and their families. He helps them relax and share stories of their struggles so that they can seek the right help they may need and also start to move forward. To help make it easier for them, Boji uses a combination of equine therapy along with storytelling. He works with wife and NMSU College of Business professor, Dr. Grace Ann Rosil. Their research on treatment states, the horse mirrors the deposition of the veteran or family member. Brazil explains how equine therapy works. So it, it helps us to get in touch with our bodies and, and be relaxed and be able to operate from there instead of from that defensive, I've got to protect myself posture. The second part of the treatment is the embodied restoring process where veterans and their families share by using sand play and plastic and cotton figures that may represent a story from deployment to returning home. Boji says that this allows for participants to take control of the moments they remember and helps them move forward. They remember little while moments of success, both in deployment and before deployment, and they're able to put those, reclaim those moments and put them in their new story, put them in their future. Boji says that he has had veterans tell him after the treatment that they are going to seek help for substance abuse or get mental health assistance so that they don't go on to become another statistic and move forward towards their goals in life. Joining us now is Dr. David Boji. He's going to share with us a little bit more about the work that he's doing. Thank you very much for joining us. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Now, I spoke with you earlier and one of the reasons you decided to go into this line of work was because of your own experiences. You're a Vietnam veteran and you really had to deal with a lot of issues coming back home. I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about that. How deep you want to go? <laughs> well, we have plenty of time, so we can go. Okay. Yeah, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I went there after Tet Offensive, 68, uh, 69. It was, you know, I was stationed in Saigon. And I think during the time, you kind of got adapted to um, the gunfire all night, the mortar rounds, the rockets, you know, we, we would listen to them during the day and say, is that one gonna land here? Is that one gonna land over there? You just kind of get used to it after a while. And then when you go home, uh, like when I went home to my family, I didn't realize how much rage I was stored, 
and how, much, how angry I was. Um, and I was just on alert. I, I had fight or flight syndrome all the time. Um, so a noise from a garbage can or, or you know, somebody forgot to refill the, the milk in the refrigerator or something, you know, I, whoa. You know, you go, well, why did I lose it? Why did I lose my temper on something so trivial? But it turns out, you know, uh, if you're not really processing the things, if you're not really dealing with them, you kind of confuse the combat zone with the homeland zone, you know, and, and you get them mixed up. Uh, everybody doesn't do that. Unfortunately, not everybody does experience this, but for me, it kind of destroyed my first marriage. Uh, I don't think I was as close to my three kids as I needed to be. Um, tended to withdraw. I didn't realize that normal people didn't drink a six pack of beer a day and two six packs on the weekend. And so I had some issues when I came back. When was it that you realized that you weren't that same person um, before you left and um, tell me a little bit about that. Did you recognize it instantly? No, no. I, you know, like everybody else that comes back from the service, I think I'm just macho and I've got it all together and I can will my way through anything. And I think I first noticed it when my daughter used to, uh, you know, I went back to, I went into college when I came out and uh, she used to take my head and say, Dad, look at me, pay attention to me. <laughs> you know, uh, you're not even here. You know, you're so involved and in, in you work or else you're zoning out on TV. Or, uh, you're, not, you're not here with us. You know, I, I think that's when I noticed it. It was also a different time period, too, when you returned from Vietnam. How was, what types of services were available or were not available to uh, veterans who were returning home from situations like that? There were no services available. Um, when I flew home on the, on the flight from uh, Tonsonu Air Force Base and landed in uh, Oakland, we were told to ditch your uniform as soon as you can, uh, go into a restroom and change into civvies, and because the American public isn't isn't going to like you, you know they they blame you for uh, murder and mayhem in Vietnam, and uh, it's not a war they support and you're not gonna be popular. You know, it's not like today, and I really appreciate the airlines now, they say, uh, you know, well, we have all of our military service members board the plane first. And I'm going, hey, where were you? <laughs> you know, in 1968, 69, 70. You know, those kind of uh, um, perks didn't happen to us, you know. How does that feel as a young person to do that, to go over and serve your country and go through what you experienced and then come back knowing that? I mean, was that just a lot of great fear instantly to, on returning home? I don't say we had any fear. I think we just had, uh, we, we were puzzled. It was kind of bizarre to us. Uh, we'd gone and fought for our country or done whatever job. I was in special services, so a lot of us did support for people out on the line. And they, um, you know, it was just strange. I remember asking when I was uh, drafted and they gave us a little orientation on the Vietnam insurgency. I said, well, I raised my hand, isn't this a war? They go, no, no, it's an insurgency. I go, well, what does an insurgency mean? <laughs> you know, we're, uh, aren't people who go over there fighting and dying? And uh, anyway, they didn't really have an answer and they didn't have a program. You mentioned no programs, no services really available for folks coming back. Um, you were inspired by this to really go into your career path? I was. Uh, I was inspired because when I was in Vietnam, I had uh, gone in the hospital from uh, exhaustion and overwork, and uh, they just kind of shoot you up with something or other to make you sleep for three days. So after experiencing that three times, I did get a little scared that maybe my brain wasn't working, but I'm pretty sure it's, it never was working anyway that well, so, but it did motivate me to read a book a day, because um, we had a lot of free time on our hands in the job I had. Uh, so I read a book a day, and when I got back, they said I, you could go to college. I'd, 
none of my parents or anybody in my family tree had ever been to college, and they said, you could get out early. I said, sign me up, I'll go. <laughs> you know, but I was so uh, kind of afraid that the brain wasn't working, so I just graduated first in my class by working harder than everybody else. And then I went, got a scholarship to uh, Ryder University and graduated first there too, you know. So I just, I had a knack for it, but at the same time I was still putting away a six pack a day and uh, not aware that other people didn't live that way. Other people didn't make their whole focus work, you know. What was it that inspired you to really, you know, get help to address those, that need? to address, the, you know, drinking a six-pack a day and um, realizing that normal people don't do that. I mean, was there anything that yeah. um, really prompted you to do that? Yeah, I think seeing that uh, my 25-year marriage was going to end in divorce and that my kids didn't have the love or affection return that I had for them. Uh, that kind of shook me up, you know, and I, my brother, my younger brother called me one day and said, you know, David, you're getting older and uh, if you're not careful, you're going to be an alcoholic. I said, okay. He said, you need to stop now. And I've got tremendous willpower, so I just stopped that day. Uh, a lot of people don't have that. I see. Now, You've been studying and researching and conducting conducting work with storytelling. Mm. Um, I was wondering what was your attraction to that line of research? Well, I've been doing storytelling research for 35 years, so it's my it's my area. I'm, I've got, not to brag, but I don't know, was it 20 books, 130 articles, so, and I get uh, a lot of speaking engagements around the world to do to do it, but I decided I wanted to do something for veterans and their families uh, coming back from deployment. So the thing is, when you're uh, in that situation, you've come back from deployment, you're reconnecting with your family, your, your kids, if you're married, and you, you're, um, of course, you could have kids without being married too, so, and the new family structures. But anyway, so you, you're trying to get going again in, in the life that you thought you had before the military. But you're still carrying Mr. Military. you still got that discipline. You're still looking for that structure. You're still expecting things, uh, you know, a noise, uh, something moves in the bush. You're like, you're on alert. You're ready, you know. That's what you're trained to be. So that just doesn't click off the moment you land in the plane and, and disembark. You're going to, you know, I people we're working with uh, will say, you know, it took my mom or my dad that came back, took them a year, took them three years before I started to recognize that mom or dad that I once knew. And so you're not just working with veterans, you're also including the family in it. Yeah, because with the storytelling, we find that you need to work with the whole family because the family has a story for the veteran, what they expect the veteran to be. The movies have a story for Rambo veteran, what they expect the veteran to be and how to act. Uh, that stereotype, that stigma in the media and a lot of other places uh, prevents veterans from getting help is they don't want to go against the image of the hero. Uh, they want to say, oh, okay, I don't need help. I'll never need help. I'm, I can tough it out on my own. Um, believe me, I toughed it out on my own and it, it, it takes a lot longer if you can get yourself back to reclaim it. Now, tell us a little bit about the research that you're doing. I mean, it's almost like there's two parts to it, is that right? Right, so the one part is uh, if you start working with veterans, uh, they normally don't want to share uh, their experiences. You know, they don't want to tell you about the worst situations. Uh, uh, maybe the blood that they experience. So they don't want to, they don't want to go there, you know? And we shouldn't expect them to go there, right? So what I do instead is just give them a couple of ways to get embodied again. And by that I mean to get in touch with their feelings, emotions, 
without going to that most traumatic incident and reliving it. The most popular therapy in the military today is a prolonged exposure therapy where they relive the most traumatic events, say a concussion or, or a loss of a buddy or uh, a shattering of one of their limbs or something. So they relive that event over and over again to desensitize them. Personally, as a storytelling theorist, I think that's wrong. Why do you uh, think it's wrong? Because if, let's say you crashed a car, do you really want to relive that crash over and over again and is that really going to help you? How is that going to help you? Um, I'd rather work with their whole life and how they can get a perspective on their whole life. So, so many, there may be an instance to where people were dealing with things before they even entered the military. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, two of the projects we're working on, one's with students, veterans, and their families. And the second one is with the uh, uh, formerly homeless veterans. And I've been working with them at a marvelous organization called Community of Hope here. It's one of the best in the country, I believe, for working with veterans, getting them their benefits, getting them off the street, uh, getting them into services like I provide. Um, I'll be going there this Thursday and doing uh, another sequence of storytelling healing seminars. Uh, that's not with family, it's just with the veterans. And, uh, you know, you, it, they want to they, they want to not talk about it, you know, they don't want to talk about it. Uh, because they f they're afraid you're going to put them back in that memory they don't really want to relive, right? And so it takes a few weeks or months for me to ex work with them to say, well, we're not going to go into that deep, dark pit. We're, we're going to look at your whole life. Because a lot of veterans um, don't have a future. They, and homeless veterans in particular don't say, well, what future do I have? I don't have my family. I don't have my kids uh, with me anymore. If they have kids, uh, maybe they still have a drinking problem. Maybe they've got other problems, other issues. And so they're used to uh, society putting them in a stereotyped character. And so I'm trying to help them resist that character and deal with their life, create a future. So we, we do some work with uh, sand play, it's called, or sand trays, where you work with action figures and um, combat figures, animals, et cetera. And they, I'll say, like, tell me how you're Tell me the story of your life from when you were born to where you're going, and they'll lay it out. And a lot of times that'll concentrate on that, on their deployment and on certain incidents. And I'll say, okay, now do it again and tell me what gets you stronger. Well, how did you, how do you maintain your strength? And they'll, they'll do it again. They'll, but this time they'll see, uh, oh, I had a certain chaplain that helped me, or I had a buddy that helped me, or I had a grandmother that was there for me, you know what I mean? Writing letters and sending me stuff. I, yeah, that person was there for me, right? And so that starts to trigger their own empowerment, their own self-empowerment, where they're thinking, oh yeah, I was doing things to control my fate, you know, I just wasn't bumping along. So it's almost like they see it physically? And yeah, it, yeah, definitely. And uh, we'll say, okay, now can you tell me what's the life you'd like to have? Where, where would you like to go with this? What are, what are your options? And they're going to be like, what options? You know, I'm stuck in this existence. I say, well, rather than replaying that existence, what are some ways you could go, directions you could go? And um, they do it. They start to say, well, I remember one guy, um, and you know, another Vietnam veteran saying, well, I'd like, to, I'd like to have a relationship. I'd like to have a solid relationship with a woman someday. He said, but I've got to get in shape first. I'm going to have to work out. I'm going to have to control some things. I'm going to have to, uh, you know, get some clothes. I'm going to have to put myself right to get that relationship happen. And, I'm, and we're working with... Uh, some of the formerly homeless veterans, and they actually want to start their own businesses. And I teach small business, and uh, so we work on, you know, what kind of business project could you have? Like, 
uh, one wants to start uh, like uh, those model airplanes, model helicopter things, and provide parts to them, to the hobbyists. Another one wants to create like a marionette theater. And I, I think that's a project we're going to work on in the next year. It's not just the sand play, but um, maybe they can create marionette uh, stage theater productions. And maybe we'll go to the Don, Doniana Arts Theater there, you know, yeah. down to the Rio Grande. Maybe they'll let us put on a, a marionette show for them. You know? I, I'm interested to know what, what do the veterans say to you when they walk in and they see this tray full of sand <laughs> and these action figures you know right next to it and you know and what do they say what's their first hey, reaction it's like really what do you want me to do i just uh, like pick out some toys and lay them out in the sand they go, why would i want to do that <laughs> I said, well, you know, it's a way to play with the materials and you don't have to talk. You can just lay out a scene. You don't have to say a word. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then they just start doing it and then they get competitive if they're around a table. Uh, the one guy says, oh, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to have this blonde in my life. And then the, the next four guys will say, yeah, I'd like to have one of those. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> so they start, they start op open up their imagination, you know. Uh, so it's not telling it the same old way that they, they, uh, they do when they talk to each other, you know? Do you do this in a group or just individually or both? Uh, with, the, with the Oak Street, you know, because the, the facilities and well, we do it in a group around a table, some food, you know? Mm -hmm. with, with the research project here, we'll do it with individual veterans and their families. And I might have three sand trays, uh, one for the veteran, one for the spouse, and one for the child. And the child will lay out their life, you know, yeah. and what's stressing them. Um, I should say there's a lot of people involved in this project. It's three colleges, uh, faculty in three colleges, you know, that are, that are doing this. Health and Social Services with uh, Elizabeth Kennedy, uh, we have uh, Dr. Hacker and Dr. Flora from uh, Communication Studies and Arts and Science and myself and my wife, Grace Ann, Rosil. So, uh, and we also have a therapist that's um, Kimmy Jordan that I'm training to do this and I'm training Dr. Hacker to do it. And uh, they're doing, doing it as well. And we're working with uh, Bernie Wozniak, who's the head uh, psychologist at uh, White Sands Military Range, Wismer, it's, you know? Um, so he's doing it. Could you tell me a little bit about the uh, equine therapy and really how that can kind of help assist with the storytelling? Yeah, you, it's amazing. Like, you, you can take somebody that's shut down and you put them out there with the horse and, you, and we just do groundwork. Um, NMSU does some really amazing uh, um, riding therapy. We just focus on the groundwork. And so we'll start with pick out a horse. Um, here's a curry brush. Uh, go and curry them a little bit. Some might be a little intimidated by horse. Some have been around horses their whole life, so they're not. And we'll just stand with them and um, say, okay, now watch the reaction of the horse. and and then start to learn how the horse is reacting to you, where you touch them on the body, um, look at how their ears move, look at how their lips flutter, uh, you know, when do they back away from you. So if you're carrying stress, um, horses are kind of timid, they're kind of scaredy cats, you know. Uh, they, in the wild, they learn to be afraid of wolves and snakes and uh, mountain lions, cougars, whatever. So they still carry those instincts. Uh, so if you go up for like, oh, they're gonna back away from you, you know? Or if you try to force a, uh, a horse that weighs a whole lot more than you do to try to push them around or something, that horse is gonna resist. Uh, so they learn to start tuning in to another being. And that horse will tune into them. I, I've seen, in my own case where let's say I come back from a trip and I got a backache, I can go in the stall 
and there's this one stallion, and he, he'll know right where my back is aching, and he'll rub his head on it. And I don't tell him, I don't, I don't go like, rub there, you know. That's he just instinctually, more than instinctually, he just can know more about the body than we know, you know. He's got more awareness. So once you start working with them uh, in simple things like currying and just walking up to the horse, well, after a few sessions, we'll do some ring work and set up some problems, like make the horse move sideways between these, t these two uh, um, objects here, or lay out your deployment and take the horse through your deployment. You know? And, and do it without a halter. Do it without a rope. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just guide the horse. So, I mean, we, we add some difficulty level to it, and uh, it really opens them up. So when they come in and do the sand tray work, and they pick out the figures, often they'll have some horses in there, some dragons, some different animals, uh, and they, they start to get a wider connection, I think. So um, we just have like uh, a little about 30 seconds left, but I was oh, wondering sorry. what are some of the things <laughs> that, um, you know, the veterans tell you when they feel like they're ready to move forward? Uh, they say that um, they're getting a better sense of their future. Uh, they're getting a better sense of how to spot the triggers in their own reactions. Uh, so, for example, if, if they start, if they got an anger issue, they start to spot it earlier before it erupts, and then they can and deal with it. Um, they say they feel a better closeness to their family. I've got uh, some people that have been participating that they're homebound. That's the only time they're really coming out of their home is to work with the horses and with the sand trays. So they're they're saying that that this is helping. Good to hear. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. All right. Our guest was Dr. David Boji. He is from the College of Business at New Mexico State University. I'm Anthony Moreno. Thanks for joining us. Por Fronteras, a Changing America.